either 10 or 20 very sick hospitalized patients or 1,000 outpatients to be able to risk stratify who's going to get sick or who I have to pay attention to in the next 24, 48 hours is really So I, I'm actually really excited about the capabilities of predicting who I, and categorizing which of the children that I take care of may get sick in the next 48 hours better than I can do it now. I have a nuts and bolts question probably mostly for Jenna, and that is um, for a, a, I work for Intermountain, so a community-based healthcare system and there are a lot of people at Intermountain interested in applying AI uh, to help solve clinic problems. Pretty standard question. Um, do you have any recommendations about the kind of people that need to be hired to do this work? I mean, obviously. Students. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, obviously, you have to have content experts, clinicians. Um, but as far as the analyst types, is somebody with an MSTAT going to have sufficient training to do this kind of work, um, or what is that skill set? Yeah, that's a great question. Starting in computer science is a good place to start. Um, there are a lot of undergraduates in CS who have um, a skill set that could help get started in terms of training these models. I frequently work with undergrads. Um, I've now taught over a thousand undergraduate researchers uh, machine learning. Uh, one of the first projects they do is mining a regularly sampled time series data collected from the ICU to automatically um, risk stratify for in-hospital mortality. Um, so that's their first project that they do in the course. Um, so I think we're, we're training the, the next generation um, of data scientists or machine learning researchers. Um, that's not going to be enough. Um, so I think in addition to data scientists and machine learning researchers, um, you'll also need contact, content experts, domain expertise, um, implementation experts, education. A, a team effort. Thank you. I think I've got the next question. Uh, first of all, I'm Matt. I'm a resident physician. Thank you for spending your Friday with us. Um, so, and just to echo on that last comment, um, there are lots of really smart people that are my friends who aren't taking the long road for the MD, um, who I think are hungry for problems, and it's our job to recruit them to work on important things. Uh, my question has to do with in unintended consequences. I think we've been touching on this in a couple places. Um, there's a good example from like the 60s and 70s of when people were using infant monitors to try and prevent sudden infant, sudden infant death syndrome. And I think it's a good example of something where we had this dream of if we could just get more data and we could predict what's going to happen, we were going to prevent bad outcomes. And that wasn't the case. Um, in terms of prevention about not putting kids in cribs that have a bunch of stuff that they can suffocate on. And, and that was one example where more information, more data um, was more harmful to parents than helpful. Um, I think that most of the things in the way where we're going about what you all are working on and brilliantly um, isn't necessarily gonna run into that. But I do hope that some of you could comment in your current work how you think about unintended consequences and um, what uh, incidental omas we might be exposing people to and how we can be smart about our research development now in terms of avoiding that in the future. So this is something that I think about a lot. Um, I think one of the biggest unintended consequences of this work could be exacerbating um, healthcare inequality um, in outcomes. Uh, right now, the you know the models that have the most data are the best models. 
Um, ways to mitigate this um, are initiatives that collect um, data from a diverse population, um, but from a technical perspective, there are also uh, transfer learning techniques um, so that even if you are um, in the minority, you can benefit from what's been learned in the majority. I'll, I'll just say one, one quick thought too. I've been, been talking with some of the researchers and engineers I'm working with and you know to gauge one example. They've shown me other examples where you know, sometimes buried within broad numbers is things like, um, you know, adverse impacts. The, the joke they were making was one of the projects we worked on is very much like a, you know, an ER triage, like trying to figure out where to send people before patients code. So anticipating where, and I know this is a very hot topic right now, there are a number of in the good number, is there a bad number built in there? And by bad number, I just mean, are you shifting resources and potentially someone else is having an adverse consequence, maybe not death? And, and it's really complex. And this gets into the driverless car part about like, you know, if you have a choice between a, a mom and a baby and, you know, two adults, which, you know, which way does the car go? Some of these systems that are looking, you know, operationally across a, large, large operation may start making decisions about where to prioritize people. We do that anyway as humans, but it, we, we need to be mindful of that as we build systems that help us do that. And I, I apologize, I have to run off to catch my flight. It's not because I don't enjoy um, all of your questions and conversations, um, but thank you very much. run as well because I'm trying to catch a slightly earlier flight so thank you very much I'm gonna make um, one comment to um, your question and and in, in my field there's often the case that the vast majority of the samples are white non-hispanic um, and somewhat we're we're continuing that because when we argue how to how to do a study we have to get to a critical mass If every center was, instead of making that argument, saying, okay, can you do everybody and then maybe focus on the ones that you have the power to ask? Because then together as a community, we will start building the minorities. And under the current model, we're just perpetuating um, the issues. So I think there's also, um, it's important to see how these things are funded. Um, because we're, we're more and more doing things as huge communities, so actually by coming together, we, we are able to answer questions that none of us separately can do. Hi, and uh, thanks for the talks, they were really fascinating. Um, my question is, well, since uh, a lot of diseases of modernity are chronic in nature, and since medicine is moving in a sort of preventative direction as opposed to treating problems that already exist. How close are we to sort of assigning a lifetime risk score or something for newborn screening in terms of um, sequencing infants? newborn genetic disease and the lifetime risk score of, of death from that disease is one uh, and often within two weeks. So uh, in a sense, you know, for a lot of these kids, there's nothing really you can do. But with these rare syndromes, there are also surprisingly enough um, that there are. So for example, Rady's uh, had a patient a couple of years ago with, I'm trying to remember, there is, it's a form, a rare form of epilepsy that's very treatable if you know what it is with uh, some compound. Uh, and so if the child is treated in the first few months, uh, you, you're seriously mitigating the consequences, whereas untreated, um, they're basically gonna die from these seizures. 
And so what they showed is typically it takes like six weeks to get a genetic diagnosis to these kids. So they're basically dead by the time they're diagnosed. But with the 24 hour turnaround on the sequencing and stuff, it's a huge difference. So I think that's the main, main impact there. Great, great session, thank you. Um, I think we lost a couple of the experts, but else to ask the question. I've, you know, one, one thing that I'm interested in, with all this, I mean, the technology is amazing, and we, we see how, you know, AI is gonna help initially to augment clinical decision, not necessarily, not necessarily make the clinical decisions. What, I, what I'm curious is in examples that you may be aware of where AI, some of the things we've been discussing, have been implemented in clinical uh, decision making already in the healthcare systems and uh, and to to benefit you know large portions of the population I you know I'd be I'd, I'd love to hear about examples where that's actually working right now and implemented if anybody knows well there are a lot of instances there's certainly um, a huge history of, of risk score uh, and um, outcomes analysis. Uh, my colleagues in BMI could probably um, comment on that a lot more than me. I think the big thing with AI is just improved means and more accurate means to, to produce those kinds of prognostic positions. I think that's the real, the real promise here. Uh, thanks, that was a great talk. We lost a couple of people, so maybe, I don't know if you guys can answer this, maybe somebody else in the audience can, but a lot of what we're talking about is risk profiling and risk prediction, um, and uh, that worries me. Uh, so, for example, I have data in the data warehouse. Of creating those phenotypes for my medical record. Uh. Well, I mean, I think you could opt out from the being able to include it in any kind of analysis. I don't really know in the sense of the electronic data that's in there other than having them expo records expunged. I don't really know. Administrative procedure. Right. Now, the use of the data is, is under the purview of the IRB, but transformation of data is an administrative procedure. So, sorry, I just want to comment on Rashmi's question. Um, the short answer is there is no global opt-out, and, and that's not really an enterprise data warehouse question or an electronic medical record question or a Utah population database question. If that's something that, uh, you know, I mean, we really need to think about in terms of offering our patients. We have opt-outs per study. So if you're contacting them through letters and telephones, they can absolutely opt out. That is our IRB's model. But at an institution level, we simply uh, And that's, those are your choices. I wanted to speak to that and also to the question about, um, so there, there's one over here that's related, and it, it's really more of a comment, I guess, just that it's a member of patient communities. There's a very heated debate right now in one community that I'm a member of that there are parents pushing to have the condition added to infant screening, to newborn screenings, and there are patients, parents, you cannot get life insurance ever as currently our so society is structured. So this is one of those unintended consequences that you want to know what your risks are, what, what the impacts are for you socially. Certain societal protections. Well, so this is uh, just to uh, sort of present the flip side and especially to Vic's uh, uh, clarification on, on the opting out, right? So the Utah Population Database and the collection of these statistics is created by statute in the state. This isn't uh, hospital policy necessarily. Um, and it's created by statute for the uh, promotion of the public health. And, uh, you know, I think we have to consider that there would be ill effects you, as uh, data starts to become a Swiss cheese um, when people who have certain uh, symptoms opt out of a, uh, a program. It, it 
detriments uh, the entire uh, the entire enterprise. So there's certainly a flip side to it, and um, something that I think we would want to consider very carefully before we did allow people to. akin to uh, issues surrounding vaccination and public health. All right. Well, with that, I guess we're done. Okay, so thanks to all of you. Before everybody leaves, just want to um, say a couple of closing remarks and appreciate the, uh, you know, the, the hard work that's been done to put this conference together. Um, Lon, who kicked us off with uh, his really provocative thoughts about biomedical discovery and large population cohorts, our LC panelists, uh, Jim Tabry, Kim Cappingst, and Kyle Brothers, our last panelists uh, who are still fresh in our minds, uh, Jenna Weens, Nikki Camp, Steve Mutkowski, and Mark Yandel. Um, and then to thank the co-organizers of, of this conference, Will Deer and Adam Bress, um, as well as uh, a number of faculty members around campus who helped uh, create the, uh, the topic and the, uh, the shape of the panels today, uh, including uh, Satoshi Minoshima, Samir Abdel Rahman, um, and others. Samantha Weeks, of course, who coordinated the logistics of this uh, rather large and complex event, as well as uh, the rest of our, our, our staff, uh, Ashley Capron, Amy Hawkins, Audrey Mitchell, Karina Pritchett, Tate Hoffer, Stacy Peterson, and Santiago Isaza. And then finally, a really terrific marketing team um, who's put together the web materials. We'll be posting both the slides and the, uh, the videos on our website handled registration and um, all of the other uh, wraparound materials, uh, Judy, Julie Kiefer, Aaron Lovell, Melinda Rogers, and Janelle White. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we look forward to seeing you very much. If you'd like to recycle your badge, there will be bins on the way out if you want to drop them. <laughs>